to everybody for dialing in uh, to a site update from the Bunker Hill Mine. We're going to start today's presentation with just a little aerial flyover of the mill construction site that was taken on July 8th. And uh, even in the short amount of time since July 8th, I think you'll recognize as we do the walkthrough at the Bunker Hill uh, mill site, quite a lot of advancement just in the last couple of weeks. And then uh, at that point, we'll turn it over to uh, Tom Francis, our general manager, who's up at Wardner, to talk a little bit about uh, and show some of the progress on the mine side up at Wardner. So, uh, Maxim, go ahead and let's get the video started. There we go. Well, thank you, everyone. And now, uh, and now we'll do a bit of a walk through the mill construction site. Uh, what you're looking at right here is the coarse ore silo, uh, fully complete and, and ready for conveyor installation. And on the left side of the the uh, coarse ore silo is the conveyor corridor, where the uh, conveyors from the crusher will come and deliver ore to the coarse ore silo. Uh, here we're doing just a little bit of, uh, of dirt work and civil works to relocate the road. And as we make our way down, uh, we'll just wait for this loader to get out of the way. Um, it is a very active work site at the moment. So uh, as we work our way through, sound may be a, a little bit of a challenge, but we'll just wait for this, this uh, loader to go by. And as we make our way down the hill, you'll begin to see the mill building come into view behind the coarse ore silo. And this is a pretty dramatic change from the flyover video that we all just saw. You can see that uh, the majority of the spans and structure for the pre-engineered mill building are complete now. We have about four sections left to go. Three of those will be put in in the next couple of days and one section will be left out to allow access to place the ball mill on the uh, on the pedestals you can see the pedestals here uh, the guys are uh, tearing out the forms the pedestals are complete and poured we just did a uh, quite a large flat pour this morning started pouring at about 4 30 this morning so they're uh, just demobilizing the pump truck and uh, you can see some of the guys at work uh, up on the steel structure this is actually progressing really quite well. 
uh, going in just as planned. Uh, one of the key things that you know we were really focused on when we acquire, when we purchased and through the procurement of the pre-engineered metal building is working with a company that had the capability to engineer, manufacture, and construct the pre-engineered metal building. Uh, really kind of simplified the execution and, uh, and that work has gone very, very well indeed. Uh, the majority of the, of the concrete is now done in the mill building. We have just one or two small flat pours left. And over the next week, we're gonna begin starting to place uh, uh, processing equipment inside of the building. And the uh, cladding will begin to go on on the far side of the building starting in the, over the next two weeks. As we make our way across the yard, you can see the uh, pedestals for the lead concentrate thickener and the zinc concentrate thickener. And uh, just coming into view is the, uh, is the rebar work for the primary crushing tower. That's the next big pour that we'll be doing over the next couple of weeks to get the crusher uh, pedestals and, and structure in place, which will allow us to place the crusher and begin uh, erecting the uh, pre-engineered conveyor sections. Coming up here on the right, we'll see uh, uh, some of the refurbished mill equipment. What we're seeing here are the uh, zinc rougher cells and agitators that have been gone through and completely refurbished by the on-site refurbishment team. And uh, you can see that these are now ready to place, just awaiting the, uh, the appropriate time in the schedule to allow these to transition from the staging area here into the mill building itself. This is the rebuild shop where all the refurbishment uh, of the Ponderé milling equipment is taking place. And as we've been saying, you know, as we go through that refurbishment process, we're seeing that the uh, Ponderé mill um, was in very good shape indeed. Uh, very little in, the ter in terms of corrosion and metal wear and fatigue. Uh, and uh, the refurbishment is really pretty light in nature, which is nice. As we make our way far further down the yard, you can see the uh, primary ball mills being prepared for installation. Uh, they've now been sandblasted and we're beginning the process of reassembling the bearings and end caps. And over the next couple of weeks, we'll be uh, moving the ball mill and setting it on its pedestals in the mill foundation, in the, on its foundations. And that'll allow for the, the erection of the final uh, span and truss of the mill building itself, at which point the building will be very quickly clad and, uh, and equipment installation will begin in earnest inside the mill facility. So I think that's, a, uh, that's the overview of, of where we are on the mill construction site. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Tom to give an update from the Wardner side and from the mine perspective. Tom? Sam, thank you very much. Um, hopefully you and, and the listeners can all hear me clearly. And, and maybe I'll just start by saying uh, my thanks, especially to Mike McCullough, who provided that superb drone video for us when he came up on the 8th of July. And we look forward to hosting him in a couple more months for kind of further drone video updates that we can share with everyone. So I'm located up at Wardner, the base of our mining operations. As the crow flies, I'm about a mile, a mile and a half away from Sam right now. And uh, uh, the last time I think we updated from this location was late last year when we were informing everyone of the upgrade and enlargement of the Russell portal and uh, the connection to the mainline electricity grid, bringing power directly onto site. And so right now I'm stood just outside our mine offices at Wardner. I've, I've chosen a spot that is halfway between the compressor and the main load center, uh, both of which are humming away quite loudly right now so that I can hear myself and hopefully people can hear me. And I uh, just wanna give a little bit of an update about what's going on uh, underground, because whilst it's clearly not as conspicuous and easy to see in a drone video, um, there's a lot going on underground as well. So firstly, 
we're continuing to, to rehabilitate down the main decline towards uh, or face. Um, we're keeping the team very small and lean right here, but they're working incredibly well. We're, we're one mine manager, two mining engineers, a surveyor, a diesel mechanic, a uh, electrical superintendent and four miners. And they're g- progressing at a rate of about 25, 30 feet a day of rehabilitation underground towards uh, the eight level. I'm stood currently on the five level, as we call it, the entry level of the Russell portal. Um, we've worked our way down through the six level, down to seven level, and we're right now proceeding from seven to eight level to continue to rehabilitate and prepare the mine for first initial ore uh, from, from the eight level. I would like to say that one of the great things about working at the Bunk Hill Mine is we already have shovel-ready ore in draw points underground, but the primary mine plan and the initial stopes come from the eight level, and so we're making sure that we're getting there in good time, and we're on schedule for that right now to ensure we can kind of mine at the rates we want to uh, underground uh, at the very end of this year and, and very start of next year. So things are going well underground and, and two other milestones that we've just recently passed are installing from Hoffman Manufacturing, installing our first new set of automated mine electric doors and installing also the primary fan. Um, uh, and installing also, the, excuse me, the primary fan, which hasn't yet been turned on, but has been sort of secured into a bulkhead and, uh, and, and will, be, will be turned on uh, next month. Alongside the underground mining, and I'll just pause there briefly and just make sure that um, uh, that I can sort of people can see me and um, and uh, so there's thank you sorry. Alongside the underground uh, rehabilitation and concurrent with that, we're also progressing with a drill program led by our chief geologist uh, Mark Crowter. That's about an eight thousand foot program, and we're about two and a half thousand feet through that drill program. Very roughly half of that drill program is, is uh, definition drilling and another half is kind of exploration and hopefully confirming and up, uh, upgrading some resource. And that's going incredibly well. They're working a night shift. Our miners are working a day shift and the rehabil- rehabilitation so that those activities are kind of synchronized for maximum efficiency at the moment. And we're very excited with the good progress being made by dynamic drilling underground, the footage that they're getting per shift and we're just at the point where we're starting to get some of the first results back from, from that. The initial results, of course, were from just pre- preliminary utility holes. But as those results come in and the chief geologist gets to review them, and we will, of course, be updating the market on, on all of that in the coming months. But that's going extremely well underground. And that will continue for most of the rest of this year uh, to complete that definition and exploration drilling program. So that's a little bit what's going on up at Wardner uh, underground, less visibly fantastic at surface level than uh, than the uh, the main yard, but a lot of work going on here and, and progressing on schedule and, and really very successfully. And I'll hand back to yourself, Sam or Brenda or Richard. Thank you, Tom. And uh, with that great update from uh, the site, think and uh, what's happening at Wardner, I think it's time to open it up for questions. One of the questions that was uh, asked was, when will we see the assay results? Uh, we, we will begin to see the assay results over the next couple of weeks. And as we, um, and as we acquire and uh, put those assay results together and work that through the QAQC process and make sure that they're in a, uh, in a report ready state, then we would expect to see us, you know, sharing the results of those uh, over the next month or two. Another question that was asked was, uh, when would we expect an update on the monetary metals refinancing? Yeah, the monetary metals refinancing process is going quite well, um, and we expect that um, you know we'll be, have you know positive report on uh, the progress and the uh, completion of that over the next few weeks. Um, maybe, uh, Richard, you might like to ask us, answer this question. What do you think the impact of increased metal prices is going to be for Bunker Hill? Richard, you're on mute. Thank you, Brenda. Um, evidently, as, as we all um, know, that if metal prices go up, um, the first effect is the... Um, amount of money that the mine will make will increase um, over the time. What we're obviously focused on is the delivery of the project 
um, on the basis of our existing assumptions um, based on metal prices that we estimated would be the case uh, through this year, but in particular 2025, 2026 and 2027. Um, it's our view that the consensus metal prices used are, by ourselves, but also by the market are highly conservative uh, relative to uh, the projections of demand relative to supply for the key metals that we're, we're um, going to be producing in the mine. Uh, so we see the actual position for metal prices to be very positive at the moment, uh, but we're tracking that um, as every miner is, as everybody going into construction, not that many mines um, is, uh, and it's a vital part of, of what we look at. Uh, but for those dialing in and not familiar um, with the plans that we put in place, and Sam can talk to this in much more detail than I can, uh, I want to emphasize that the metal consensus that we use for our business plan is highly conservative and far below that, uh, which is the current spot prices. Terrific. Um, uh, do we anticipate a resource update at any time, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. So our intent and uh, and as part of the resource drilling program, uh, we'll consolidate the results of that resource uh, conversion drilling and resource expansion drilling. And we will be looking at a, providing a resource update uh, and, and a, an updated uh, mine plan based on that resource early in the new year. Terrific. Um, the uh, the creator of the video has asked that I give a shout out to Doug Hall and his team uh, for their assistance in uh, making the uh, video and also said how impressed he is with all the progress that we have uh, illustrated today at uh, Bunker Hill. Well, thank you. Tom, do you have any uh, comments that you'd like to leave everybody with? Oh, okay. <laughs> I think you read it if you want to say something. Yeah. Tom, any final comments from you up at the Wardner site? Uh, no other than on a hot Idaho day, I'm enjoying being at a higher altitude and things are humming along safely and very efficiently here. And uh, otherwise, thanks everyone for the opportunity to provide an update on the underground as well as the surface section. Perfect. Um, say, Tom, just give us a feel because you you and the guys are also working on an underground video uh, that we can share with the market um, about the progress under there. Just talk a little bit about what you're doing uh, with that and when you think you're going to be able to release it. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I kind of saw the first raw footage of that, what we want to be able to share with the market to complement the, the the great images coming from the main yard and the construction of the process plants is uh, it's just a sense of being able to drive in through the new and large Russell portal and drive all the way down uh, kind of have a helmet camera kind of pro cam view all the way down to the where the drill rigs are and to kind of where the ore faces are and so uh, I, I got the first kind of seven minute kind of raw footage of that uh, last night Richard was having a look at I think we'll just we're just going to basically compress that a little bit so for the uh, you know so we're not being too uh, abusive of people's time but um, but the intent will be to share that and so you can have that experience of, of seeing going driving in through the portal and going all the way down seeing those uh, automated electric doors that we've just installed that I referred to, seeing the primary fan, seeing just how clean and good the housekeeping is, uh, seeing the power coming down, the decline and uh, all of the utilities and uh, and then seeing the drill rig un underway as well. And so I think we're really in the editing stage and I think we'll share that, Richard, in the next one to two weeks. Great, thanks. And Sam, um, you know, from your perspective, you know, what Tom's going to be showing is a portal access um, for the mine, which is different uh, to the other mines in the Silver Valley. Can you just explain to people on the call what are the advantages of to that uh, and why that makes Bunker unique relative to the other mines, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. It, um, it allows a, a significant uh, advantage in terms of access to the mining area. Uh, the, the other mines in the Silver Valley, uh, the access to the mining area and to the reserve that's being mined is gained through the uh, travel and uh, material movement up and down a, a shaft. Uh, and, that, um, and that can be uh, quite complex and adds complexity to the mining system and the mining process. So uh, the, the, the fact that we can access our mining areas and the extraction of ore by 
simply driving to it is a, a distinct advantage, both from a productivity and a cost standpoint. Thanks, Sam. And with respect to the infrastructure, Tom, that you've put in underground, I know people will see this video shortly. Um, uh, and Sam talked to it as well, uh, is we have the advantage of inheriting a lot of infrastructure that we've had to refurbish. So the actual startup capital required for a mine like this relative to other, say, greenfield operations is exceedingly small. Can you talk a little bit about the advantages that we've been able uh, to make most of at Bunker Hill relative to, say, a greenfield site uh, that's having to sink ramps and put in ventilation and, and, and the power and so on? Yes, yeah, certainly, Richard. And I think the point I'd make is the, um, the video to which I was alluding, which will give the kind of viewer the experience of, of driving in as if you were in, uh, in a haul truck or a loader in through the portal and down to the, to the, to, to the face, the ore face. Um, uh, the only one section of that was driven as kind of fresh new decline in kind of hard country rock. And we completed that in late 2022. That was connecting from the five level. Again, that's the level I'm on right now. Uh, that, that's the level of the main Russell portal. Uh, that was a decline dr driven from five level to six level. But thereafter, um, we're already using pre-existing pre -existing decline that we're simply enlarging. And so uh, we're adjusting uh, the, uh, the all, all accessible parts of the mine to a kind of 13 foot high, 11 foot wide dimension for our drifts and our, our declines. And that accommodates all trucks that can have a capacity of 20, 25 tonnes, six yard cat loaders and the size of kind of jumbo drills that we um, that we operate. But uh, other than that decline, which we've completed uh, in 2022, what we're really doing right now is just uh, using pre-existing infrastructure and just simply enlarging those uh, those declines already to get us to, to where we want to go. And the other example of that is once we had power delivered from the grid on the surface to uh, up to where I'm stood, and we dropped that underground through the cherry rays again through a pre-existing uh, pre-existing rays that's that's one of our escape ways and uh, and didn't need to kind of drill or find additional access for that that raise was uh, again in, in position suitable and ready for that kind of power drop and allowed us to get power where we need it in the most direct and efficient way possible so the whole mine plan was conceived on the basis of minimizing excuse me minimizing kind of additional uh, work that we need to do and maximizing the sort of pre-existing infrastructure. And I think the other point I'd make is, of course, from a safety point of view, we're always inspecting ground support. We're always ensuring that's, that's good and that's robust. But, um, uh, but when you walk around underground in a bunker hill mine, you realize that kind of declines and uh, drifts and tunnels from 40, 50, 60 plus years ago are in remarkably good health from a ground support point of view. And so the additional work that we need to do, which we are, of course, you know, bolting, uh, meshing, putting in kind of additional kind of ground support strips, landing strips. Um, we benefit enormously from the kind of geotechnical robustness of the ground to, uh, to ensure that we're not having to kind of dig through collapsed tunnels and, and we're really just kind of uh, uh, um, benefiting from good natural hard country rock. So those are some of the, the big advantages that come from the underground infrastructure. Maybe one other thing I'd say is that, again, because of just quite how extensive pre-existing underground infrastructure is you know we benefit from having not just the secondary escapeway which is down through the Kellogg tunnel um, uh, but also a tertiary escapeway which is up through the cherry rays as well as the primary Russell portal access and all of these are, are kind of historic but valid um, robust uh, and workable kind of uh, infrastructure options that have uh, exist for us already today so uh, so those are some of the advantages of doing this versus a greenfield option. I think I would add to that, Tom, you know, by just saying that uh, it is distinctly unique for a mine restart, an underground mine restart, to, upon restart, have the first three to five years worth of ore accessible with the uh, capital development. And that's a distinct advantage that uh, we are well developed. Our access to ore is, uh, is, is second to none. And we're able to have a long runway from an underground development standpoint and access to ore uh, upon startup. So that, that, I believe, is a distinct advantage and difference between a Brownsfield restart with existing infrastructure 
and a gr new greenfield project. Thanks, Sam. Um, again, one, I'm keen also, there's a couple of questions that have come up, but Tom, given that you're, as you said, a mile and a half uh, as the crow flies uh, between where you're standing and where Sam is standing, when the um, ore comes out of that portal that's near you, it's got to drive over to where Sam is for the processing once it's had primary crushing done to it. Uh, you've recently done some work up there to help with dust suppression on that site and between. Can you talk a little bit about that and perhaps even show what you've done? Yes, certainly. And, and I'll also just try and sort of uh, just just turn the camera around again in a second to give a feel for that. But um, the uh, the other advantage, again, and, uh, of, of pre-existing infrastructure and of restarting an old mine is that the whole road that connects where I am uh, to where Sam is, uh, is, is again, a pre-existing whole road. And so we have uh, we, we own the majority of the land and we have legal easement through those parts that we don't own. And that's a whole road that's in very good state. It doesn't need to be uh, broadened uh, for, for the capacity that we'll be conveying over it. And, uh, and so we have advanced plans for the surface haulage of the ore that will come out of the Russell portal and uh, then be the primary crusher will be at my location where I am in Wardner, then loaded into uh, surface haul trucks that will have a capacity of 40 tonnes or so and then driven. And, and the haul road, I refer to the kind of direct line from myself to Sam, the haul road is a downhill, uh, gentle decline. Uh, it's about a two and a half, three mile haul road directly into the, uh, the yard where Sam has stood. And, uh, and where there'll be a secondary crusher and then it'll en enter the kind of process plant system properly. And in terms of the kind of environmental aspects, you know, we've, uh, we've, we have our pre-permit to construct from uh, the Idaho Department for Environmental Quality. And a key part of that was making sure we understood and we can control and we prove and show that we can control air emissions and dust emissions. And so one thing we've done very recently up here is um, apply a kind of pine tar surface to the hall roads in and around the mouth of the Russell portal and the, uh, the Wardner footprint to minimize dust and it's been incredibly effective and uh, I'll just try and give a quick sort of um, a quick view of that to, to those watching. Now I see that's the sort of I can see what that is Tom and yeah just just for um, uh, you know people that uh, are sort of wanting to understand a little bit this that's great great tom um is that one of the advantages that bunker has from an environmental footprint perspective is we're keeping all of this construction um which includes the road and everything uh, within a pre-existing envelope um, an area that was previously mined and disturbed we're not looking at expanding this out into you know greenfield areas uh, and that's very much part of our approach, which is to minimize the environmental footprint, keep it within uh, the existing mine footprint, uh, and thereby um, preserve the best uh, of the remarkable environment in, in the Silver Valley uh, of Idaho, um, which is great. Uh, so that's another important point um, that Tom's able to highlight from there. Um, thank you, Tom. Um, Sam, are you still on? Yeah, sorry, I had a connectivity issue, but I'm back now. Yeah, one of the questions here, it says, I understand uh, that this is the same mine as in the past, but will you be focusing on the same ore, or is this a new version of the company, this new version of the company looking to do something a bit different? Um, essentially talk a little bit about, Sam, I think from this question that would be helpful, uh, what are the reserves that we're mining? Uh, what is the nature of them? There's another question related to the metal mix. Um, uh, just remind people of the history of them uh, and what we're doing in stages uh, to give give uh, the guy who asked this question a, a bit of a feel for um, what our mind plan is and what the difference is and what we've done to enhance it uh, since we inherited these great resources. Sam? Yeah, absolutely. So the Bunker Hill mine operated continuously for 100 years, starting in the late 1800s. And its uh, metals uh, of focus were uh, zinc, lead, and silver. Uh, five million tons of base metals, kind of evenly split between lead and zinc, were produced over that 100-year life, and an additional 165 million ounces of silver. Um, that makes it the sil third largest silver mine and silver producer in the Silver Valley. 
which is the largest silver mining district in the world with over 1.2 billion ounces of silver produced in o over its uh, mining life. Now, uh, historically, the Bunker Hill mine, from a revenue perspective, was uh, evenly split from a revenue between the base metal component and the silver component. Upon restart, Bunker Hill will be more dominant on the zinc front uh, with roughly 70% of the revenue generated from the production of zinc. Uh, but what we see is that over time, there's a, uh, there's a lot of leverage and a lot of uh, focus, and, and our focus will certainly be to rebalancing the revenue stream where silver plays a, a, more, uh, a, a more forefront role in uh, revenue generation over time. Um, our, re our reserve, our, our resource right now, we have set a little over 7 million tons of measured and indicated material and 7 million tons of inferred mineralization. Now that is uh, by nature of the area in the mine that we're working it is more zinc dominant uh, at the moment and upon restart. But as the mine plan progresses and as our access to the deeper areas of the mine um, are made available by the mining front moving down, we expect and we will and our intent is certainly to through exploration and through resource conversion uh, bring silver more to the forefront of our production profile over time thank you sam and and for those who don't uh, remember this i'll remind you is that sam is 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 particularly um is different to the rest of us um in, in many ways um but one of which I'll draw out here is, is, is his father worked on the Bunker Hill mine back in the, in the 1970s. Um, uh, Sam, of course, and, and I have known each other for 10 years. Um, he was out uh, developing barracks mines in Saudi Arabia and Africa and so on, and has essentially returned to the place that his father was working to bring this great mine back into production, uh, providing new and long-lasting American jobs in an area that will really benefit from it. Um, Tom and I have uh, worked together over the same period of time, but in different um, uh, uh, different environments. And himself as an American citizen who's come uh, from working in Utah uh, to Bunker Hill as our general manager, is again representative of the type of people uh, that we've got leading the restart of this operation from the ground. This is not a fly in, fly out operation. Our leaders live, in Sam's case, 25 minutes walk from the mine site. In Tom's case, 40 minutes drive from the mine site. They live with the community. They communicate with the community. And they feed from and gain the support of the community in this vital project uh, that we're bringing back into production for both our stakeholders, our shareholders, the community, uh, and the nation within which it is founded. This will produce long-lasting jobs and provide essential metal to improve industrial res resilience uh, within the United States of America. Um, what you've seen today, and we're happy to answer more questions when I get off the podium here, what you've seen today is from Sam, um, the uh, uh, construction uh, of the processing facility and, and alongside it where our tailings filtration facility will be established. Um, and all done within an existing footprint. We're making maximum use of the space we've got available rather than taking a bigger bite out of the environment. We don't need to do that. We're being efficient. And then what you see from Tom, our general manager, project manager up at the mine site um, where the mining is happening at Wardner. Um, unfortunately, you don't get to see the mining or you don't get to see the infrastructure. We'll give you a video link to that later. Um, is the type of base that we put together and the thoughtful connectivity between that base and Sam to ensure, again, the minimum environmental footprint uh, for successful restart uh, of mining operations. Um, again, I look forward to any questions directly or indirectly on this, uh, but this has given you an opportunity to get from the ground um, some of the key impressions that we want to share with you of great people doing important work uh, in uh, a wonderful mine site and developing it in stages sustainably using the minimum amount of capital.
With that, maybe I'd like to uh, just say that one of the uh, comments was that a lifelong resident whose grandfather worked at the mine thanks us for uh, what we're doing and certainly for answering the questions today. I'm in Kellogg this week and uh, I get that comment consistently wherever I go. People are certainly excited to see what uh, is happening at Bunker Hill and I invite anybody with further questions to reach out and we'll respond to you as quickly as we can. Thanks. I see there's a question here. We'll, we'll keep on going. And you keep on asking us questions. We'll keep on answering it. Um, I said, is zinc is now a strategic and critical metal? Uh, it always has been. I mean, the U.S. government's been stockpiling zinc as part of its defense uh, procurement program since the 1950s. Um, uh, but it's now a strategic and critical metal. Have you asked the U.S. government for assistance developing this resource? Um, uh, we only seek from the government uh, the environment within which we can operate. Um, we're not directly seeking from the U.S. government financial support. Uh, um, we will take any uh, particular advantages that the U.S. government wishes to deliver to an industrial project like this in terms of tax, in terms of um, support to local banks that wish to seek us finance. All of that we'll seek to do. Uh, but we're operating uh, as an independent entity in support of both our stakeholders' interests and the national interest. And again, what Sam, Tom, our finance team, not on this call, has been able to do is been able to deliver, the is, is in the process of delivering a restart project on behalf of our stakeholders of huge benefit to the community and the nation within which we operate without having to need uh, special industrial subsidies or, or special money. Uh, but if such money needed to be available, uh, if they wish it to, to sponsor us, of course, we'll take it. Uh, but I want to make that very important point. Uh, we're not in the business of dependence upon the government. Uh, we're seeking to do something that is nationally worthwhile, supported, appreciated uh, within the uh, environment and the bounds of, uh, of, of uh, the national uh, guidance. Sam, is there anything you else want to say on, on that? Because there are some specifics I probably brushed over. Yeah, I think what, what I would say on, on that, Richard, is that, uh, you, you know, Bunker Hill, right from the start, has been focused on a, uh, on a um, capital efficient restart, getting back into production and, um, and generating free cash flow to reinvest back into the operation. So certainly, you know, we see tremendous opportunity that uh, can be unlocked with the access to capital. And, uh, and if there was a situation where um, uh, low cost capital or capital was uh, was available. Uh, we certainly see ways that we can deploy that capital to add significant value. Thanks. Sam, there's one other question perhaps you could respond to um, from Eric. He asked, what pricing per metric ton is a conservative figure do we use? Uh, well, Eric, um, you know, per metric ton, I'd have to do some conversion in my head. So if, if it's all right, I'll speak in, uh, you know, dollars per pound and dollars per ounce. Uh, but what I can say, it, it, there's a wide view on consensus pricing. I can tell you what we used in our, um, in our price assumptions. We used a dollar 10 zinc, $20 silver, and uh, 90 cent lead for all of our, uh, for all of our production, our, all of our, um, projections. Now the consensus prices, depending on what you, who you look at, you know, they're sitting around a dollar 20 zinc, um, in some cases, maybe a little bit lower, uh, you know, 20 to $22 silver. Um, and, uh, lead is really pretty consistent around that 90 cents to a dollar range. But having watched pretty closely the, uh, in particular, the zinc market over the last few years, um, you know, there's a few trends that, that I see, one of which is that at every point in the last four years where the zinc price has dropped uh, below uh, $1.15 per pound, you see an almost immediate response with supply dropping off the market. So uh, from my perspective, uh, I think that, um, you know, that is a pretty strong indicator that the zinc price over the long term is really only sustainable um, above a dollar fifteen an ounce. Probably, I would suspect closer to a dollar 
uh, 20 um, and, and is really, you have a healthy supply demand dynamic um, right about where we are now, I would say at about $1.30 per pound. On the silver side, uh, it's quite interesting. You know, we, we had a, uh, um, almost a step change, it appears, in silver price from, uh, from where it had been trading in a fairly tight band between $20 and $25 uh, an ounce for quite some time to uh, uh, about eight to 10 weeks now, I believe, where the silver price has been uh, trading in a pretty tight band between 30 and $32 an ounce. So it'll be interesting to see over the coming months, um, you know, if a new floor has, uh, has emerged for the price of silver. Lead, uh, I, think you, I think that when you look at the long-term pricing in lead and the way that lead is uh, behaving in the uh, global market, uh, not much reason to think that lead won't trade in a pretty tight range uh, between 95 and 95 cents a pound and a dollar. Well, I think that's the end of our questions, Maxim. Perfect. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, taking us through the site tour and the questions. Uh, so thank you uh, all for submitting your questions and for all the positive comments. It's actually been incredible to see the progress uh, as I, you know, uh, watch and, and also participate in these events to some extent. Uh, so uh, as always, this recording will be available to watch on demand in the coming day or so, uh, even the coming hours. Uh, so look out for that. And uh, before we wrap up, any closing thoughts from any of you? Oh, Richard, you're muted. Sorry. Sam, could you just put the camera on to the, the processing building and the, the steel that's yes. gone up there? I can't quite see that from the stand you've got at the moment. Yep. That's really, that's really quite remarkable. Um, okay, that's where you're standing. Yeah, you can see, you can see the size of the building. It's it's very substantial. And and just before we head off, what do you expect as, as I look at that? Just say over the next four weeks that we're going to see that's going to be different. Just repeat that particular point, please. Well, certainly there will be equipment being uh, placed and mobilized into the building itself. You'll see the building being clad and covered in. And then immediately to the right, uh, you'll see a large crusher tower uh, be constructed, or uh, sorry, a transfer tower for the conveyor system constructed here. And where these, where these individuals are working on the rebar, you will see a uh, large crusher tower uh, being poured and erected in this space. So I would expect that the, on our next video, we'll see a large crusher tower and installation in this location, a large crusher or a large conveyor tower there, and you will see a building that is clad uh, with, uh, you know, with potentially a video on the inside showing the progress of equipment placement. Thank you. And, when, and just for the people on the call, when we say equipment placement, that's the sort of mill... Um, and then the establishment of the mezzanine level uh, flotation and various other things. Just talk a little bit about that again, please. Yeah, absolutely. So essentially it will be uh, fill, filling the mill building in with the actual processing plant. So primary ball mill, um, the regrind mill, flotation cells, uh, the, uh, the zinc thickener, the lead thickener, uh, the uh, concentrate filtration uh, and the pumping and piping and electrical systems that uh, make it all run. Got it. And what's remarkable about that is our primary ball mill came from Golden Sunlight, Barrett's Golden Sunlight uh, operation in Montana. And the rest of it has come from uh, Tex Pondere uh, operation in, uh, in Washington state. Uh, so again, in terms of environmental footprint, we're helping other companies reduce the footprint of their closed sites, and we're making use of the long life um, equipment that they have uh, to breathe life once again here into Bunker Hill. Um, it's a great uh, story of recycling uh, and efficiency. And I think for all viewers on this call, we'll do what we normally do, uh, which is every time there is something photogenic uh, with respect to the progress We'll release that. We'll explain precisely what we've done. Um, and you can be as excited as we are 
about all the steps that we're taking uh, to get this closed and get it back into operation. Forgive me, <laughs> get the job done uh, and get the uh, mine back into uh, operation. Thank you, Sam. Um, Tom, any any final points from you? I, I think I would just say, with regard to what's going on underground, you know, we will look forward to starting to share kind of uh, drill results as and when you know uh, it's appropriate and, and we've got uh, uh, a critical mass coming through and that's something else that we look forward to, to sharing in due course that's great uh, thank you i've got no other i just want to thank everybody for being on the call thank you brenda for and maxim for just, setting uh, this up. i think it's been really interesting um sam i'll leave the final word to you um as ceo i just um, wanted to sneak in a couple everybody. questions here uh, sorry, Richard. We just had. A, I wanted to sneak in a couple questions here uh, oh, from from the audience here, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Uh, really. Just two questions here. It looks like. Uh, um, uh, sorry, to interrupt. Just how much ore uh, in terms of truckloads per day would be anticipated? So uh, we're uh, when we get fully commissioned and, and we're up and running, eighteen hundred tons per day is the uh, is the uh, base base kind of uh, mining rate. So we'll be um, operating a fleet of 20, 25 ton trucks. So we're talking about um, uh, sort of, you know, 80, 80 to 100 loads a day, but we'll be operating 24 hours a day. We'll, the overland haul road from Wardner to Kellogg is a more substantial pre-established haul road as we're talking about. And we'll be able to operate larger trucks on that. And so we'll be talking about two or three, uh, two or three runs an hour um, for kind of 40 ton haul trucks to accommodate that, uh, that, that capacity. So that's the initial 1800 tons per day throughput. We have, we have plans beyond that, but that's the kind of initial uh, base rate and the kind of uh, number of uh, runs we'll be doing underground and overland. Perfect. And last question to quickly just shoot in here. Uh, where will the silver ore be processed and refined? <clears throat> I'll take that. Uh, all of the concentrate, which is the product that we sell uh, it will be purchased by uh, Tech Metals and refined into finished product at their smelting facility in Trail, British Columbia, which is about 180 miles away by road from the site. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, so just going to pass things back over uh, to you there, uh, Brenda, Richard, Sam. Well, Sam, yeah. Brenda, over to you, Sam. Why don't you flick... Uh, flick the camera back round onto yourself and give us a few last words and we'll uh, we'll sign off and thank everybody for uh, uh, coming on. Yep. Uh, there we go. Thank you everybody for dialing in. We're really, we really enjoy uh, you know doing these uh, video updates. It, as you can see, there's a lot of work going on by a lot of incredibly skilled people. So, you know, as we uh, sign off, I just want to uh, mention, you know, the, the team that we have, Gypsy, who is uh, doing all of our uh, uh, project ma can construction management, Maverick, who is uh, erecting the, um, the pre-engineered metal building, Performance Energy Solutions, who's doing all of the concrete and foundation work. We have an excellent, excellent team of people hard at work here and uh, are doing a great job. So uh, with that, look forward to uh, seeing everybody on the next update.